Everybody done? Is somebody not logged into it? Because it looks like you're all here. I only have 32. Oh, I didn't. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's take a look then. It looks like you're pretty good. These, this is all information we need to have in order to understand why we use hormonal contraceptives the way we do. So if you're having trouble here, the, it won't make as much sense to you. Okay. Next thing I need to learn to do is how to make that bigger, right? Okay, so the first 14 days of the menstrual cycle are referred to as follicular. Okay. So luteal phase is the last half, the last 14 days. The most variable of the phases is the follicular. So when women have different cycle lengths, it's due to differences in follicular. The luteal phase is pretty much set from time of ovulation to menses is 14 days. But you already knew that. Okay. All right, next one. Uh, pituitary gonadotropins are 100% FSH and LH. And that's because of your strong endocrine background, right? <laughs> the predominant hormone during the first 14 days of the menstrual cycle is estrogen. estrogen. So if you think in luteal phase, you probably pick progesterone. Day one of the menstrual cycle, this is important because we all need to speak the same language. Um, so the first day is the day menses begins. It's the easiest to mark. Okay, so that's day one. Okay, so when you're talking to women about when to start uh, a product, you're going to talk about it from, and it's important here because when do the LH and FSH start, right, or when does FSH start rising? Very beginning, early on. And we'll talk about why the implications that has for uh, missing a pill early in the cycle. Okay. Um, FSH direct effect on target cells is follicle development. Follicle stimulating hormone. Follicle. Okay. What's in the follicle? The egg. The egg. Oocyte. Maybe the more physiologic term. Okay. The primary estrogen produced by the ovaries in women during the reproductive years is estradiol. So guess what? The most of the estrogens in uh, combination birth control pills is estradiol, except we slap a big ethanol group on it because then the liver can't metabolize it very well, very easily. So better living through chemistry. Um, estrone is more the uh, predominant in postmenopausal women because we store a lot of it in fat. So women uh, before uh, they go into menopause for a number of years, will on average lay down 12 pounds of fat. And that becomes their estrogen source. Some of you are going, what? Yes. <laughs> and there's a reason behind it. It's a reason why women put on that weight around menopause is because of the, of the one of the reasons is that. Ovulation is? <laughs> Put fertilization beyond them. That's fertilization. So release of the follicle from the ovary is ovulation. The release of, a, of the egg. <laughs> ovulation occurs primarily as a result of the surge of what? Oh my gosh. <laughs> What's the main reason that the, the follicle will release. Surge. It's LH surge. Okay. So when women are trying to become pregnant and they're having difficulty 
what we can do is we can measure that LH surge. We start about five days before we think that it will happen. And when that surge happens, we tell them, have sex now, have it as often as you want, because in the next 36 hours, you're likely to release an egg. Okay. Uh, the corpus luteum is formed from the granulosa cells of the ruptured follicle. That's right. It is not in the endometrium. It does, uh, the placenta takes over its uh, actions as it, uh, as it matures, and it is, the, the last one's nonsense. Specialized cells activated by LH in the production of progesterone. Okay, last one, the next one. The corpus luteum primarily produces what? Progesterone. Okay. That is, that is the, the luteal phase, and if you get pregnant, that's what will sustain your pregnancy for the first 12 weeks until the placenta can take over. Probably not the only thing, but one of the major things. If it doesn't happen, women tend to miscarriage early and frequently. The predominant hormone in the last phase of the menstrual cycle, okay, we did it. So we're done? Yeah. Okay. Those are basics. If you had trouble with those, you've got to go get back and get them hammered down uh, because they're, they're essential pieces of the, uh, of the menstrual cycle. All right. Questions? Any questions about them? dissect them out, but this is really a good thing to keep around while you're going through this part of the, of, of the uh, module is what is happening in, in the follicle, what's happening, what's driving it. it's going to be those pituitary gonadotropins and then their release of hormones and then what happened in the endometrial. It is such a complex cycle, we just dumb it down to the very simplest and that's the level I understand it at. So I don't... Uh, pretend to understand all the nuances you should appreciate from Indo now that it, the hormones are extremely complex and sometimes a large amount is inhibitory and sometimes a large amount is excitatory and vice versa. Okay. So understanding this will help you to understand what's happening when adverse effects occur uh, with the hormonal products. Um, if women come in and they're, they're telling you I'm spotting very early on, well, it's because they don't have enough estrogen. If they're spotting late in a cycle on birth control pills, it's not enough progesterone. I mean, it's just simple things like that that will really help you uh, in understanding it. If women are, um, have you had, have you done the infertility? <laughs> So when you get to infertility, one of the things we look at is where's your LH coming in? Where's that LH surge? When women do not, if they're not adherent to birth control pills early on, what happens is you get an escape of the FSH and LH. Very early it starts rising. And those follicles are developing even when a woman's having menses. So there are three, or three to six of them are already starting to develop. We suppress it out because we give a mostly negative feedback that suppresses those gonadotropins, and so the follicles don't develop. But if they do develop and there is escape, the hormones are, are great in that the endometrium isn't prepared. So if you get a fertilized egg, and this is where people get into difficulties ethically with uh, birth control pills is because you could have a fertilized egg, but you've created a hostile environment that, that it can't implant in. So if, if women have uh, pushback or, or strong feelings about that, there's good reasons based on, on that um, alone. It also changes mucus uh, so, and makes it more hostile to uh, sperm uh, traversing the cervical canal. So they are multi-pronged. That's why they're so effective, uh, but they have to be taken. 
and has to be, and he has to be adherent. So I've gotten a little ahead of myself, but that is why this is important to understand, especially if you're going to deal with women's health in any degree, primary care uh, or in a, a specialty with women. Okay. Let's uh, step back though first and look at page two of your handout and look at the different types. So I'm not going to talk just about hormonally, but though a lot of women use them, um, and they're they're the most predominant of the non-surgical, um, like um, behind your tubes. That becomes more predominant as you as women move along and get older. But there's different types. So one of the things I find most young practitioners struggle with is their preferences versus the patient preference. You, in this regard, you have to step back and you have to um, talk to the patient about the different options. Uh, if, that's, if that comes up. And you have to suspend judgment. What you may do is not what they would do. Or what they would, will do is not what you would do. Um, so understanding these and what the, the good and the bad. At different times, in different parts of the life cycle of a woman, these products are more appropriate than others. And we're going to talk about those. Underneath this, we're going to go through factors that you need to think about in terms of, of helping a woman choose or partners choose um, a contraceptive product. So let's kind of look at the, at the table. So the barrier methods, uh, they are just what they say they are. They are either a chemical or they're a physical barrier for sperm going up the cervical canal. So, and they're more effective if we use them together. So mechanical barriers would be like condoms. So we have male condoms, female condoms, most people are familiar with. We have diaphragms. They've been around forever. Um, these are probably one of the oldest forms. So you can find sponges being used, and that's the basis of the today's sponge. That are go back uh, several thousand years, women using freshwater sponges uh, as a uh, contraceptive or as a barrier. Um, Takeoffs on the diaphragm is something called FemCap. There's one called Lea Shield. There is a cervical cap, more common in Europe, not so common here, uh, that can all be used. And then the chemical barriers boil down to the spermicides. Again, I will say the physical barriers are always more effective if you use them with a chemical barrier as well. Hormonal. So these are multi-prong in terms of what they do. They inhibit ovulation, they alter the endometrium, make it less likely for implantation to occur. They increase cervical mucus, make it thicker, uh, especially the progesterone part. Sperm can't go through as well. So these would be the combined oral contraceptives, the transdermal patch, uh, vaginal ring. All of those are a combination of estrogen and progestin. We do have progestin-only contraceptives. We don't have estrogen-only, we don't do that, but we have estrogen plus progesterone, and then we have progestin-only. So if women, and we'll go through all the problems with estrogens, um, so for women who can't, who have contraindications to estrogens or can't tolerate them, you can put them on a progestin-only uh, product. Um, next would be the intrauterine devices. So this is another old, old concept of placing something in the uterus that will then make it an, uh, a place that uh, implantation becomes difficult. So we have quite a few on the market. Two of I've put there. Paragard is a non-hormonal. Uh, the rest of them, it's the only non-hormonal that I can think of. And then there's several hormonal, Mirena being one of them, that uses a progestin. So it has, they're also two prone. You put a foreign object in the uterus, it makes it a little bit more irritable, inflammation sets up, don't tend to produce a, a healthy endometrium. And you put a, um, a hormone in there, like a, a progestin, and you decrease the ability of the endometrium to develop uh, normally. Uh, sterilization, so this is permanent, the, all the others are reversible. Um, surgically blocking the fallopian tubes, or we, we disrupt the vas deferens so that sperm can't um, leave the body. So tubal ligation, tubal implant, a lot of them have come under uh, fire, those tubal implants. Some of them are being taken off the market. 
Uh, the tubal ligation still exists, vasectomies. Another one that women uh, may use solely or they may use in conjunction to avoid pregnancy or to get pregnant. So multiple ways that fertility awareness is used. It's a more time intensive, you have to be uh, much more diligent because it usually takes a daily awareness of what is happening. Uh, it can predict the most fertile time so that you can have sex or avoid intercourse. Uh, this would be the basal temperature body method uh, as, you're, uh, as you go through your cycle. Uh, your temperature will rise as you get close to uh, ovulation and then it will stay elevated for the rest of the, uh, of the cycle. Um, the other would be uh, paying attention to cervical mucus. So cervical mucus under the uh, direction or influence of estrogen is very thin and watery and when you get to ovulation it gets very thin so that the sperm you know, don't have any barrier uh, to moving up a cervical canal um, and as you get under the influence of progesterone it gets very thick and tenacious and sticky um, so using combinations of those things women can predict when they're more fertile or in combination with another like a barrier method they can know when to avoid the most fertile time so those are used uh, in combination or they can be used by themselves um, <clears throat> Questions about those? So that's just an overview. Those are the words we'll use. Barrier method, hormonal method, IUD, sterilization, fertility awareness. I'm not going to spend any more time on fertility awareness other than what I've told you. Uh, so let's talk about the factors that should be taken into consideration in the selection of a contraceptive product. So the first thing is typical use and perfect use. When you look at studies that, that will report, here's the number of pregnancies that occurred in perfect use, and usually most studies have highly motivated people, uh, and they, that is usually your best conditions. That would be perfect use. And then they'll report with typical uses, usually once it gets out into the general population and people can use it however they think is right. So there's a disparity, you can imagine, between perfect use and typical use. Okay. The more a person has to do something with a product, the more likely pregnancy will occur. Okay. So, taking a, so, so sterilization, nothing, nothing do you have to do. You better have a good surgeon, and you better listen to what they say in the beginning, uh, but after that, you don't have to do anything. So high inherent efficacy, right? That goes down to number two. Highly in, uh, tech, tech, uh, user technique, very low. Okay? So that's why people who never want to have any more children would move to that. Hormonal products, highly effective. Less than 1%, less than one pregnancy per 100 women. But it requires user technique. You have to take it. Some of them, like the progestin only, you got to take within a three hour window every day. So even though the pill is very effective, if you don't use it correctly, you'll get pregnant, usually, if you're a young woman. Um, IUDs would be another high, high inherent efficacy. Very little that women have to do. We can teach them how to check a string and check placement. Expulsion is most likely to take place after a cycle. Uh, so we can teach them to do that, but really they don't have to do very much. Barrier methods require a lot. They are inherently effective. Condoms are very effective. They are least effective when people do not use them. Okay. So that's where the typical use comes with the condom. Or you got a guy that's carried it in his wallet forever, and the sheer forces have weakened the, the product and it breaks or it's, it doesn't function like it should. Okay. So you have to think about, like if you're looking at a teenager, then you, or usually extremes of age are very different. Teenagers, you want very highly effective, low technique because they, in, their adherence rates are, are low. 
When you get so when you get women past about the age of 30 to 35, they are the most reliable in terms of using products correctly. They are the least likely to take risk. So you have to look at risk. Uh, that goes over to page five, motivation. So there's so consider this. I want to have a, I want to become pregnant sometime, but I want to put it I want it to be in the future and I want to be able to plan it. Versus I never want to be pregnant. Okay? Two different motivations, right? So who's willing to take the most risk? The person who wants to be pregnant but is but really wants to plan it off into the future. They will take more risk. They will skip something, they won't use it. At a, when they're having intercourse, maybe it just wasn't convenient, they forgot, something along that line. Okay. So that really goes, so, so knowing the motivation of, a, of your patient or the, or the couple uh, is important in, in which products to use. If you are really intent on never being pregnant, you would not choose barrier methods in a 20-year-old, in 20-year-olds, 20, 20 to 25, 20 to 29-year-olds. Highest fertility time. So, so motivation. What's the motivation of the person? That will go to how well they will use the product usually. Women as they get older get are the most least risk takers. Men under the age of 25 are the highest risk takers. Okay? So look at the couple and, and, or, and uh, take that into account. Uh, age and fertility. So women's reproductive years that span over what age? Have you talked about that? No. 15 to 44. Long time. But that doesn't mean at the extremes of, of those ages, they are, it's probably the less fertile of all fertility. Okay. Young women, 15, usually teenagers, don't have regular, don't always have regular cycles. Women at their, at the end of their reproductive span also don't have regular cycles. So ovulation prediction is, is less. Women in their 20s, highly fertile. At, at 30, fertility starts to decline. Usually doesn't affect most women until they get near 40. And then fertility continues to decline. So there is a continual downward decline. So another thing to take into account. If you're highly fertile, then you really need a very effective product if you're wanting to avoid pregnancy. Okay. If you're over 35 and you don't have intercourse very often, exposures reduce, then you may take on a product or accept a product that inherently less effective, requires you to do more, but you're more motivated. See the differences? See how those figure in? Okay. Uh, frequency of intercourse, very important. If you don't have exposure, you're not going to get pregnant. Okay? So four or more times a week, pretty high uh, frequency, need to have an inherently highly effective product if you're wanting to avoid. Costs. Costs are different. Intercourse dependent. So if you have to have a product when you have intercourse, condoms, they're the least expensive. Those that are intercourse independent, like pills, most expensive. Now, there are some differences here. IUDs are really expensive up front. But uh, the Paragard, you can wear it for 12 years. So if you cost it out over all the months that you would use it, low cost. But up front is high. If you have an implant, like Nexplan, Planon, a uh, high cost up front because it requires you to come to a doctor, have a small surgical procedure, and so the cost is. So you have to look at costs over time, uh, but that upfront cost may be, um, may be uh, in a prohibitory. Some people do not like to interact with the medical system, so act, interacting with you is a barrier to some people. Okay, So having products that are available to people like barrier methods that they do not have to access. Now I'm not saying it's the best, 
but at least there is uh, there are products available that people can use that don't that require them to interact with you. The more they have to interact with you, the higher the cost. So if they have to come in for a nurse visit every three months for a Depo Provera shot, that's more costly than if I just am going to go buy condoms. Risk of sexually transmitted diseases. So if you are dealing with partners who are at high risk, so that would be multiple partners, frequent partners. Um, those are high risk. Um, so those usually are most inherently effective products are the least effective for STDs. So barrier methods are your best. So sometimes you recommend Okay, you take the pill or you're on an IUD, but if you're in a high-risk situation, you also need to use a condom. So some is looking at products as, can I use a male condom or a female condom with them? Okay, it's two different motivations, two different treatments. So one of the... So most people, you would say, use a contraceptive to plan family planning, right? Or avoiding pregnancy. But there are two other very good reasons. One is prevention of cancers. So cervical cancer, very high risk in, in uh, women who have frequent intercourse with multiple partners. Okay. Only barrier methods will prevent that or de decrease their risk. Okay. Prevention of STDs, huge. Have you all had STD lecture yet? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking of my son, because in biology when he was in high school, they did an STD lecture. When he, that was probably the very single most motivation, more than anything I could have ever have told him that motivated him. Okay, so prevention of STDs. Your highly effective products, surgery and hormonal products will not protect you. IUD will not protect you. There's no protection of that mucous membrane. So the barrier methods are much better. The male condom, female condom, female condom, the best, because it covers the most surface area. Male condom better, or good. Uh, diaphragm covers everything from the cervix above, so it might decrease the risk of PID in women. So you got to think about that. If you're dealing with somebody who is very likely engaging, or you can get a history of engaging in high-risk behaviors, think barrier methods. Not as the sole, but usually in conjunction with uh, another product. Other facts to, to consider, how does the product work? If you have someone who has a physical disability, cerebral palsy, young women had stroke, that's not uncommon in, in younger women, can they physically manipulate the product um, for it most best use? So if they want to use a barrier method, let's say they can't use a hormonal method, then can they do that? Can they use it? Do they have the cognitive ability to understand a complex product and use it correctly? Non-contraceptive benefits, we're going to talk about that. Uh, that is one of the things that I'd say the hormonal products rank very high. Uh, in terms of other benefits that they offer, and we use it for some of those. So keeping in mind other things. So what are some non-contraceptive benefits that you know about just contraceptive products in general? Cysts. So it won't get rid of cysts, but it'll keep them from, from developing. What else? Regulate your period. Regulate your period. So dysmenorrhea or really dysfunctional, unpredictable periods, you can do that. What else? Acne. Acne. Okay. Some of our products will make you have acne, but a lot of them will prevent it, will decrease it. What else? Hormone levels. BMS and BMS. Say it again. Hormone levels that are abnormal. How would that play out? Tell me what you're thinking of. Like if it. the ovary is not responding or not producing? Um, okay. Have you had endometriosis yet? No. So one of the ways that we regulate endometriosis is we can use just constant birth control pills. So that's one thing, I, one area where I can think about that. Uh, we use them in women who are perimenopausal. Uh, we can keep them from having hot flashes. We can regulate their cycle time, cycles, so it's more predictable. Okay. 
That's good. And we'll go through some others as we uh, look at the different products. Um, how reversible it is. Okay, so if you want to not be pregnant during a specific time, but you want to be able to get pregnant, you got to know how reversible. Some of these products are not very re reversible. Depo Provera, two years, 18 months, 9 to 18 months probably. The pill, easily reversible. IUDs, easily reversible. Take them out, you can get pregnant in a month. I'll, I'll throw some of that as we go through too. Concurrent diseases and conditions. So when we talked about hormonal products, we'll talk about a laundry list of things that you should, are contraindications to the use of those products. Uh, so a lot of these don't have a contraindication, which is good. But you got to think about that. You got to think about cardiovascular. You got to think about clot risk. Um, you got to think about cancer risk, maybe. Talk about physical abnormalities. He's going to talk about postpartum, and you got to think about breastfeeding because some of these drugs or products affect uh, milk production. So if you're wanting to breastfeed, then that is that's that is um, it's very distressing. Okay, questions about those? Lots of things to think about. Okay, depends on where the person is in life, what they're dealing with, what motivations. Fertility, how often they're having sex, how often they put themselves in situations where the sex is high risk, um, how much does it cost, what other diseases could it affect. Okay, so we're going to talk about those and bring these in as we go through the different products. Okay, so we'll start with estrogen progestin uh, comp, uh, contraceptives because they're probably the most common. These are known as the pill, oral contraceptive, combination oral contraceptive, birth control pills. All of those usually are referring to the combination products, even though they're not specific. So when did the pill come along? 1960. 1960. Revolutionized women's health. Had a huge impact. Um, so nowadays we have them mostly as pills, but there is a patch. And there is a ring, and they are all combinations. They all have both a progestin and an estrogen. So how they work, multi-pronged, just like we talked about. You're going to suppress LH and FSH, so the gonadotropins. Um, they suppress at the hypothalamus level, so they suppress gonadotropin-releasing hormone and their effects on LH and FSH. They <coughs> inhibit... Probably the number one thing they do is they inhibit ovulation. That is the most, that is the reason why we use it. Inhibits ovulation. So, follicles can still develop, but we're going to inhibit their ability to be released. If they are released, then we talked about implantation, uh, usually is not, um, doesn't happen because the endometrium doesn't develop, and then the impact on, um, on cervical mucus. Okay, estrogen and progestin names on the next page. You need to be able to recognize them. So, um, at this point, the only estrogen we use is estradiol. We used to have mestranol. I don't think anybody uses it anymore. So, estradiol, but we put big chemical compounds on them uh, in order to keep them from being undergoing big first pass effect. So that ethanol group, ethanol estradiol, EE, is usually the number one product you'll find in combination. So the valerate and the, uh, is just a salt, salt form. The progestins, there's a gob of them. The biggest thing to remember is that the progestins we use in, in oral, uh, in the combination products, or the, the progestin onlys, are derivatives of testosterone, most of them. So what does that tell you right off the bat? Oh come Andrew, on, what, does it, what would it, what does it, what would you immediately think of? The side effects? Side effects, okay. So the side effects are mostly that we get from the progestins are androgenic. 
Now, when the when the product when these products first came out, we used big doses. We used a milligram of estrogen a day. A milligram. Do you know what we use now? Ten to less than thirty-five micrograms. <laughs> The progestins we use 10 milligrams a day. Now we use one milligram. Okay. So these products came out, women flocked to them. And then within about 10 years, the rate of uterine cancer went way up. And so what, was, what had happened is you had way too much estrogen. So you got increase in endometrial cancers. Uh, and so women ran away from them. That's when diaphragms became very popular. It was also around the 70s, early 70s. And that was when women's liberation came about. And that was when women were like, they rejected medical practice, the medical practice over their life because most of them were men. And they had no, and they had started to have a freedom because they could have, they could take a pill and they could have sex anytime they wanted to or not. So that, so that drove people away. Well, they came back and reformulated them. And ever since that, you've seen a decrease in the amount of those hormonal levels in those products over the years. To the fat point where we, are, we just have minuscule amounts that we use now. And that's why non-adherence gets people in trouble. That's why we used to say that pills were about less than 1% of women would get pregnant. Now it's about 3%. And it's because of that, the low levels we use. We also got smart and we got around the side effects of those drugs by making them very physiologically patterned uh, after what normally happens. So we start varying the amount of estrogen and progestin throughout the cycle that we use them in. Okay. You almost had a hard day because some of you are zoned out and are in another place. Okay, first generation. Norethindrone, ethanol, ethanodiol, norethindrone acetate, one of the more common ones. Second generation, norgestrel, levonorgestrel, one of the most common, levonorgestrel. And then uh, norgestrel is in uh, the, like the, the ring. Third generation. Now these are synthetics, so these are created, lab created. Desogestrel or gestimate, etonogestrel. This one is another one that's in, um, it's either the patch or the ring. The other is drosperinone, which is actually looks like aldosterone, or it, it, I'm sorry, looks like spironolactone. But re, where does spironolactone come from? Testosterone. Aldosterone. <laughs> what does it look like? It looks like aldosterone. Where does aldosterone come from? That first layer. Look back at that, um, that lecture I did on adrenal uh, treatment of adrenal diseases. And look at those layers. And what was the very first place we started? What was the precursor to everything that was made? Cholesterol. The next thing you see is like progesterone. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, what happens is we can use one of these products because they have androgenic-like effects. So that's where that drosperinone came in. And then Dynagest. Okay. Recognize those and know the generation they come from. The reason why is because some of them have a higher risk for clot risk, increased clot risk. Okay. All right, so who is a good candidate and who is not a good candidate? So let's look at what affects your choice of a hormonal product. I know people write these like there is nothing to them, but I'm, there's a lot to them. Most women, probably if they're healthy, no problem, but some of them are going to get into big problems if you don't think about a few things. So contraindication. If you look over on page six, I have... This is actually an abbreviated list of all the contraindications. We'll go through them when we get to that page, but for the most part I've, I've grouped them. Cardiovascular is huge because the estrogen part 
increases clotting factors. The progestins have uh, other effects. They increase clotting risk. They also increase uh, um, LDL, cholesterol. So the cardiovascular, clotting disorders, complicated heart valve disease, stroke, ischemic heart disease, and multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Okay. So who can you think of right off the bat that might fall into that? Who would fall into that very last one? Multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Young woman, diabetic. They've had diabetes for 30 years, 25 to 30 years, absolutely. So then you see breast cancer. If we've had breast cancer, we're not going to give you an estrogen. If you've had a history of BTEs, we're not going to give you an estrogen. Uh, liver disease. So liver disease uh, can has is many prongs. One is that we rely on the, the liver to metabolize these products. The other is that higher doses of them can actually cause liver tumors. The tumors are benign, but if they grow big enough, they can rupture the capsule around your liver and cause you to bleed out and die. Uh, so that used to happen with the higher dose products. Very high inherent efficacy. Less than 1% with perfect use. Perfect use. User of a technique does affect the efficacy. It has to be taken every day. So you see a, a typical use is 93 to 97%. So things that affect user uh, technique would be if you have hormone-free periods, if you have pill-free periods. Okay? So that's why those continuous are good because then you can only mess up four times a year. Uh, the patch has to be changed every week. The ring has to be changed every week. They are coming out with a ring that can be inserted for the three weeks left in place and then removed, but it's not on the market yet. In terms of age, these products are, are effective across all age ranges, from the 15-year-old to the 44-year-old. They're effective. The thing that affects that is adherence, mostly on the younger age, in the teens, the adolescents. They are inter intercourse independent. So women who have frequent intercourse, these are a good product and that want to avoid or uh, delay a pregnancy. Fertility, easily reversible. Now how many of you heard it, it, it makes you less fertile? That is a common misconception. What happens is if you take it for five to ten years, your underlying fertility has changed, the pill has done nothing to change that. So it's the length of time people are on it, and it's the underlying changes in the uh, in the person. It's not the pill. Yeah. I had a, med a nurse, I think it was, um, when I was in EMT school, saying that she recommended waiting a couple months after you stop. So what's the half life? Is it does that make any sense to you? Half life, nothing. Uh, so that that used to be for they would say two to three months. Mm -hmm. That's well, what she said. Yeah. Okay. There really is nothing behind that, but what there is no um, medical reason behind it. But a lot of people recommended it. One is just to let the, the axis re uh, uh, reestablish. Mm -hmm. But now the, the amounts are so low, I would say that it, within a month, most women are going to resume a, a normal period, maybe two months. So some women would become pregnant before they'd ever have a cycle. They'd ovulate. And so then they get pregnant right, you know, without, without really expecting it, I guess. Uh, so that, that's the only reason. There really isn't any medical reason why you would need to wait. Um, risk of sexually transmitted diseases. There is no protection with these products, zero. So if women are going to put themselves in a situation where they are high risk, they don't know the partner, they know the partner's had multiple partners, they ought to use a barrier method. Or ask their, ask their partners to use the barrier method. Okay, postpartum. This one's important. How soon can you start it after somebody delivers a baby?
So during pregnancy, have you, um, did y'all talk, did we, um, let's see, back when we did thromboembolic disease, did they talk about the impact of pregnancy and postpartum on clock rates? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happens during pregnancy? It goes up about 20 to 30 times over normal. What about postpartum? It's like 40 to 60, it's huge. Those first few weeks, two to three weeks after you deliver, your clot risk is the very highest, okay? So we're not gonna put an estrogen progestin on top of that. Okay. So the one thing you, uh, the other question is, are you gonna breastfeed? We don't worry so much about the hormones going through the breast milk. What we do worry about is that it de decreases, the estrogen component decreases milk volume. When you are trying to establish your milk volume, it's very distressing to have something that will, will interfere with that. So we, that's the, one of the reasons we don't recommend combination products um, in, when women are breastfeeding, especially in the first few months. Okay. So if they are 21 to 42 days postpartum, so if they're three to six weeks postpartum, and they're not going to breastfeed, then you need to evaluate their clot risk. So, are they older? So, clot risk goes up with age. Have they had a previous clot? Do they have family members that have had clots, like a sister, a mother? Um, so, you'd be thinking protein S, protein C deficiency, factor V lighting uh, deficiency. Are they going to be immobile? They're in a cast, they've been put to bed rest, something's happened that they are going to have to stay in bed. That, that's a big one. Uh, thrombophilia, so there's something wrong with their clotting system that has um, hopefully been identified. They were transfused at delivery. They're obese. The more obese a woman is, the higher her clot risk. Postpartum hemorrhage, cesarean delivery. They had preeclampsia. They're a smoker. So women at risk for a clot should not start these products before six weeks. After 42 uh, with the days, then the clot risk goes back to baseline. Yes. Why a C-section? Is that just because of I don't surgery? Know. Probably. I don't know. Probably you've activated uh, the clotting system, number one. Uh, platelets, I don't know. I don't know. I'd ask the, whoever comes in why that risk goes up. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Women who are not going to breastfeed and are not at risk for a clot, then they could be considered at 21 days. Now, most OBs are going to tell the women don't have sex until six weeks, at least six weeks. Let, your, let, let all that area heal, recover come back to normal, okay? That, but that doesn't mean women do that. Um, so the other thing to keep in mind is that most of these products are going to be effective right away. Uh, if, they need, if they need a um, effect right away, IUDs will work. Barrier methods would work. Um, okay, that one is an important one. Make sure you know that clotting part and risk. Breastfeeding, we talked about that, estrogen reducing 20%, 35% uh, uh, at, 20, at 24 weeks of use. Where's the, the, so the CDC came out and recommend and said that these products could be used after 30 days postpartum. Okay, so we'll talk about this, this when we do lactation, but women who fully breastfeed, don't, they don't ovulate. Um, so their risk of, of pregnancy is really low, uh, as long as they're fully breastfeeding. Uh, so probably discouraging them from a product or use a barrier method uh, because the risk of, of pregnancy is, or conception is really low. Cost. Okay, so what about the cost of these products? They require a physician visit, provider visit, and usually an ongoing once a year. Um, so there is some expense to them. All right, so we'll start back with non-contraceptive benefits after the break. And go walk around and wake up, and I'm going to turn on some here because you're <laughs> 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 <laughs>